Hello, welcome to the first video of our MDCN series. My name is Dr. Mariam, and today we will be discussing the MDCN style for general physical examination. But before we begin, please take a moment to like this video and subscribe as it will really help out the channel. We will now begin the process of our examination. To begin, we will need to greet our patient. Good morning, sir. Mm -hmm. And then we'll proceed to perform our wiper, to wash our hands. And as we do that, we introduce ourselves and take consent. Sir, I want to perform a general physical examination on you. Is that okay? okay. Thank you. I'm wearing gloves because we're in the middle of a pandemic. As you can see, our patient is already positioned and exposed. The position for general physical examination should be at 45 degrees, which is the semi-recumbent position, with the patient lying supine and the palms facing up, which is the anatomical position. So the process for knee examination begins with inspection. For general physical examination, we'll generally inspect the patient. Is the patient alert? Is the patient in any distress, like painful distress or respiratory distress? Is the patient of adequate nutritional status, meaning is the patient wasted? of normal weight or obese will look for any scars, scarification marks, traditional marks or tattoos. And then finally, we'll look around the bedside for any attached items like IV lines or catheters. After that, we will need to begin the examination. The examination is best done systematically from head to toe, beginning at the hair. So, so I'll just examine your hair. So to examine the hair, we'll pinch the hair and rub. What we're doing is checking for coarseness. Normal blood hair is supposed to be coarse. In diseases like liver disease, the hair may turn fine or even sparse. After that, we will check for body temperature using the dorsum of our hands on the cheek. After checking the temperature, we will check for the eyes. We are looking for two things in the eyes, pallor and scleral ectoris. So to check for pallor, while already at this position, we will just use our thumb and pull down on the lower eyelid and ask the patient to look up. Sir, can you please up? look up? So, as we can see, there's no conjunctival pallor. Next is to check for scleral pictures by pulling on the upper eyelids. Sir, can you please look at my finger? Keep your head still, follow my finger. So, the point is to get the patient to look down, to look at the upper sclera for any scleral pictures. After finishing with the eyes, we move to the mouth and we inspect around the lips for central cyanosis. After that, we ask the patient to do two things. Sir, can you please open your mouth, bring out your tongue, and raise it up, raise your tongue up. Thank you. So when we do that, we're checking for three things. Pallor at the buccal membranes, central cyanosis on the tongue, and the general oral cavity for hydration status of the patient. So in regards to central cyanosis, in anemic patients, it might actually not show because you need at least 5 grams per deciliter of the oxygenated hemoglobin in order for central cyanosis to show. After nutrition with the mouth, you will now examine the lymph nodes and the first group is the cervical lymph nodes. To examine the lymph nodes, we usually stand slightly behind the patient and using the pop of our fingers, we rub against the bone. So we start with the submental submandibular, pre-auricular, post-auricular, occipital, anterior cervical, which is divided into three groups, upper, middle, lower, posterior cervical, and then supraclavicular. To do the supraclavicular, we usually ask the patient to shrug. Shrug, sir, can you please do this? Yes. And then we'll check for the supraclavicular lymph nodes. So before we move on, I want you to do two things. I want you to think of five causes of lymphadenopathy. And secondly, I want you to think of a name we call a left supraclavicular lymph node, usually as a result of gastric metastasis. After the supraclavicular lymph nodes, the next group of lymph nodes to check for are the axillary lymph nodes. There are five axillary lymph nodes named central, apical, anterior, posterior, and lateral. Some of these may have multiple names, which can get a bit confusing, but just try to memorize these in order to lessen the confusion. To examine the patient's axillary lymph nodes, we hold the patient's right hand with our right hand, slightly abduct the shoulder, flex the elbow, and examine with the other hand. So to check for the central, we just feel in the center of the axilla. After that, we push towards the patient for the apical groups. 
Then we feel along the anterior axillary fold for the anterior group, along the posterior axillary fold for the posterior group, and we switch our hands to check for the lateral group of lymph nodes along the medial side of the humerus. We do the same thing with the other hand. So left with the left, can I please have your hand? Slightly abduct and flex the elbow. Check for central, push for apical, anterior axillary fold, posterior axillary fold, and we switch for lateral. The next group of lymph nodes is the epitrochlear lymph nodes. To do that, we hold the patient's hand like this, and we rub against the medial aspect of the elbow. We do the same thing on the other hand. Thank you. And we rub against the medial aspect of the elbow. Thank you. We move on to inspection of the hands. So we take the patient's hands and examine the karma surface for pallor. Ideally, I'm supposed to take off my gloves to compare to see if there's any evidence of pallor. After that, we switch to the dorsum of the hand and we check for peripheral cyanosis on the tips of the fingers. The next step is to check for finger clubbing. To check for finger clubbing, it's important to know the five stages of clubbing. The first and earliest sign is the nail bed fluctuation. The second sign is loss of angle between the nail bed and the nail. The third is increased curvature of the nail, so the nail will be pointing more downwards. The fourth sign is drumstick appearance. And the fifth sign is hypertrophic osteoarthropathy. So the logic is to start from the latest sign and move downwards to the earliest sign. To begin, we will need to squat and look at the fingers at eye level. When we do this, we're checking for any drumstick appearance or increased curvature of the nail beds. If that's not present, we ask the patient to do this. Can you please do this? And don't do this. Put your nails together. When we do this, we're checking for the presence of the chambrous window. If that's obliterated, then we can see that there's loss of angle. If that's still not present, then we move on to check the earliest sign, which is nail bed fluctuation. To examine for nail bed fluctuation, we use three fingers, our thumb, our index finger, and our middle finger. So how to do that is we use our thumb and our middle finger to stabilize the finger, and we use the index finger to check for fluctuation of the nail bed. When that's not present, we can safely conclude that the patient does not have finger clubbing. The last thing to check in the hands is for capillary refill. How we do that is we press on the patient's nails for about one to two seconds and we take off and we see. We should see the rush of blood immediately. Normal capillary refill is pressed and prompt, meaning it should be less than three seconds. After we're done with the hands, the next step is to check for skin turgor. This can be done in the skin of the upper chest or the abdomen. Skin turgor is normal recoil of the skin. So the skin is normally elastic and when the patient is dehydrated, that elasticity decreases and the skin turgor decreases. How you check for skin turgor is by pinching the skin and watching for recoil. So as you can see, this patient's skin turgor is normal. The next step is to check for inguinal lymphadenopathy. There are two groups of inguinal lymph nodes, the horizontal and the vertical. The horizontal chain is directly below the inguinal ligament, while the vertical chain is along the saphenous vein. So now we just check for inguinal lymphadenopathy. After that is to check for the popliteal lymph nodes. To do that, we simply ask the patient to slightly relax, relax your leg. We flex the knee and we dig in our fingers to try and feel for popliteal lymph nodes. After examining the popliteal lymph nodes, the last step is to move to the feet. Examination of the feet begins with inspection. So we have to inspect the feet for any discoloration of the toes, any missing toes, any skin changes. We check the toes for any evidence of fungal infection and we ask the patient to lift their leg to look underneath to make sure we're not missing any forceps. After that, the last thing is to check for presence of pedal edema. So how we do that is we first ask the patient if they have any pain in their feet. So do you have any pain in your foot? No. Okay, thank you. So how we check for pedal edema is first of all, we need to press our fingers over the dorsal aspect of the foot. But before we do that, we need to look at the patient's face to make sure the patient is not wincing, which can mean or indicate pain. So after looking at the patient's face while pressing, we look at our fingers, we take it off, and we rub to see if there's any pitting. After doing that, we move on to the medial malleoli, we press, looking at the patient, and then we take our hands and feel.
examination of the feet concludes physical examination. So the last thing, a very, very important thing that you need to remember to do is to thank your patient. Thank you very much, sir. So to answer the questions we asked at the beginning of the video, causes of lymphadenopathy ranges. They can be from infection, which can be viral or bacterial or mycobacterial. It can be malignant, it can be autoimmune, and it can be others like saccharidosis and amyloidosis. It's important for you to know these facts for the exams as sometimes they may ask. Secondly, the name of a left supraclavicular lymph node that arises usually from as a result of gastric metastasis is called Burkhaus node. This concludes our general physical examination. Please like the video if this was useful. If you have any questions, leave it in the comment section below. Most importantly, please subscribe. As always, thank you for watching and I'll